Okay, um, so we're going to start now and I'm going to pass on the word to the first of our speakers, Gabriele in a second, though um, I just wanted to welcome everyone who is joining us online. It's always very odd to do these things online because you don't really see who is in the audience, but you believe there's someone in the audience. That's how we feel. Um, I'm joined today by a wonderful lineup of speakers and I'm going to introduce each of them um, before they speak and then at the end there will be an opportunity to ask questions um, and also to really open up the floor for discussion. One thing I should say, the topic of today's talk is around the idea of feminist curating, which is a, what I like to define as a working concept. What does it mean to address gender in the context of permanent collections, exhibitions, and different types of platforms? And we're really lucky to have with us four pioneering women who've actually really addressed this in their respective institutions. Um, but first up is Gabriele Schor, who is the director of the Verbund Collection in Vienna. She has curated numerous exhibitions and has published many works, including monographs of artists Renate Bertemann, Birgit Jurgensen, Lu Louise Lola, and Francesca Woodman, as well as the catalogue resume of Cindy Sherman's early works, which was something I didn't even know, but I Googled you, Gabriella, and I found out um, today. But um, over to you, I'm going to make you a speaker now. Um, so I'm going to pass the word um, So I'm going to pass the word over. Hmm? Okay, know. so I can see nobody of you, however, I believe that you can hear me and you can see me. Unfortunately, I cannot hear you. Okay, I'm starting with the presentation. Um, yeah, thank you, Flavia, for introducing um, me um, and for, invita for the invitation. Yeah, who is Verbund? Uh, maybe I mentioned this uh, shortly. Um, Verbund um, is Austria's leading uh, producer of hydroelectricity. And whenever you come uh, to Vienna, you all are very welcome to visit the headquarter of Verbund in Vienna. And we have a very nice, uh, um, it's located in the center of Vienna in a baroque place. And we have a very nice intervention um, from Olaf Wilson, Yellow Fork. Uh, it's in uh, on the uh, alongside the facade, 40 meter facade of uh, the Verbund building, and um, so every day when the sun goes down, yellow fog rises at dusk for one hour on the 40 meter long facade of the Verbund building. Yes, and um, yeah, the corporate collection. Um, Verbund Collection was founded in 2004, so now we we exist uh, for, for since uh, 17 years. And inside the building, now here you see the outside the building. And uh, ah yeah, the yellow fog is only for one hour every day when the sun goes down for one hour. And inside the building, we have an exhibition space. Uh, it's actually simply our staircase and uh, seven floors, but we call it the vertical gallery. And here we have, you can see, we have um, the Louis Lola exhibition, but we had also Cindy Sherman coming to Vienna to our vertical gallery. And we had the exhibition on the occasion of the, um, Catalogue Raisonne, the presentation, what uh, Flavia mentioned. And we had uh, Francesca Woodman and Birgit Jürgensen, so many exhibitions. So that is the, um, yeah, the vertical gallery. How many uh, artists and works we have in the collection so far after 17 years? Uh, 840 works by 140. 57 artists and um, yeah since 
yeah and so you can see um, um, we have a lot of more uh, women artists um, three quarter and uh, so this is uh, yeah what I think uh, it is um, a decision by by yeah by myself and and the advisory board so we both uh, we all thought about uh, to focus on more on women artists uh, two topics one is the feminist avant-garde Flavia mentioned it. it it is actually a tour it's tour it's a touring exhibition uh, and since 10 years it's touring through Europe uh, but we have also another um, another um, yeah focus what I can call the perception of spaces and places so for example we have the biggest uh, um, Fred Sandbeck um, uh, collection or Gordon Mata Clark and, and many many others and of course Olaf Eliasson's pieces um, uh, intervention the yellow fog uh, belongs also to this chapter chapter and one maxim uh, we have is uh, depth before breath so we collect more in in depth rather than in breath um, yeah maybe I mention also now uh, some initial decision um, when I started with this collection um, I I had um, an agreement with the with the CEO of uh, Verbund um, and they gave me free hand uh, for acquisition decisions together with my advisory board and I think this free hand this curatorial free hand was very important um, yeah so and um, I thought it would be good uh, to focus on a unique theme and um, yeah in the language of the business you can call it unique selling point um, which is actually what uh, I, I started to build up is the what, it, what is called the feminist avant-garde and um, on the very beginning I also thought uh, which with which decade I should start um, uh, and I thought it would be good to start with acquiring works from 1970 on uh, because this was a very important uh, decade uh, a lot of artists uh, went away from painting went to uh, uh, decided to work, make works with new media photograph uh, performances uh, film and so on and I wanted and also on it was the time of the um, the time of the beginning of the postmodern it was the time of um, yeah of the feminist movement um, of the 68 uh, student re revolt and I wanted to have this um, this atmosphere and these ideas in the collection and um, on the very beginning it was also important uh, to have a, a advisory board and um, they were on the beginning a kind of door opener for example curators uh, from the Tate Gallery, Kunsthalle Basel and later I had the pleasure also to work with Camille Morino who is also part of our group and for example Jessica Morgan who runs at uh, the Dia Art Foundation but when we worked together she was curator at the Tate Gallery in London. Yeah and um, and yeah we also produced uh, Flavia uh, mentioned it already uh, some publication uh, on the Austrian artist Birgit Jürgensen and Renate Bertelmann and then the catalog recently with Cindy Sherman the very early works when she was a student in Buffalo before she moved to New York before she, start, she started uh, to make her famous untitled film stills 
um, she produced great works and um, we put that in the catalog resume of her very early works from 1975 to 77 and then we have also 80 works by Francesca Woodman and uh, the main um, yeah many many works by uh, Louis Lola um, I I would like now to start uh, to give you some ideas what uh, what is going on with the feminist avant-garde um, this is um, the in the 1970s um, yeah they had this cent central credo uh, of the women's movement from the 70s was that the personal is political and um, therefore relevant to public discourses and um, a new theme new themes uh, were discussed for the first time in the public in the public at that time for example pregnancy childbirth motherhood housewife Sexu sexuality, uh, partnership, beauty standards, rape and the female body and um, the artists uh, of the feminist avant-garde they took up these issues in their work and um, there are different themes I would like now to give you only four uh, there are much more but in the work you can see for example uh, the domestic agenda housewife mother and wife so um, for example uh, the Austrian artist Birgit Jürgensen um, she she creates an iron stove and put it over her body and wearing it as an apron and with the bread in the stove Jürgensen is alluding to, to, to the saying to have a bun in the oven which means to be pregnant and I it was interesting to find out that even Helen Chadwick in London because Birgit Jürgensen was living in Vienna at that time um, Helen Chadwick in London constructed also a kitchen object and she's wearing it also over her body as well so I think it's interesting to find this uh, um, yeah, in a way similarities. Uh, the, another Austrian artist Karin Mack interpreted ironing as a contemplative practice yet here she dresses black as if she were attending a funeral. With her whole body she lies on the ironing board she let her arms hang down close her eyes and declares the death of housewife okay another uh, interesting point of view is um, for the feminist avant-garde is um, that they show works uh, locked up and where you can see and um, where you can see that artists wrap their faces and bodies in various kinds of cocoons and um, I would like to show you two works um, one is both are from German artists one uh, from Annika Zolter um, they both artists didn't know each other and didn't know their work both artists wrap their faces however in the last photograph of Solter's work she cuts the yarn with a scissors and frees herself from the burden of patriarchy where for Eisnecker there is no liberation in her piece because I asked Renate Eisnecker do you know the work of Annika Solter and she says no and um, no it's not possible that she knew because she Annika did it later I asked Annika if she knew the work by Renate Eisenacker and, and she said of course uh, no she said no they, they didn't know as a she 
do not she didn't know it at that time but what i think is interesting is that they had a similar aesthetic strategy but even find a um, different um, solution in a way because Eisenhaker said told me there is no she she there is no liberation in her piece because um, the women's movement have far from one through another topic of the feminist avant-garde is the female uh, sexuality I would like to give you one example um, because many artists uh, highlighted the oppression of female sexuality and the sexual objectification of women. And in her little known photo collages, Penny Slinger dresses in a wedding cake costume where her legs spread wide. In front of her vulva, she places a suggestive eye. Suggestive eye. And in the title, I see you, which is interesting because it's I is myself, but also the I, and she um, she indicates the vulva not anymore as a passive organ, but rather becoming an active active organ that has power over the male viewer. Finally, um, I would like to introduce you to some artists who um, yeah, picked up the, a lot of role, role plays, role play. So many female artists escaped from their one dimensional role in society and role play seemed to be the appropriate tool to question cliches and stereotypes. And uh, what I think was is very interesting that um, I found out uh, the works by Cindy Sherman, okay, the early works, and then also Martha Wilson. And then finally, I found these wonderful, great works from Marcello Campagnano, an Italian artist. And when you see all the works in, in this section of the uh, role play, you think, I mean, it's, you think, Marcella Campagnani, could, it could be Cindy Sherman. So, uh, and they all didn't know at that time in those years in the 70s about their work. And I think that is really astonished and, and very interesting. I would like to give you another example, Francesca Woodman, Birgit Jürgensen and Renate Bertelmann. Again, similar uh, works uh, and those artists didn't know each other here again all the three artists pressed their face against the class and um, yeah so on the end let me uh, explain a little bit about the term feminist avant-garde which uh, for me uh, was uh, important uh, to, yeah, to bring this term up. Um, and I would like to explain why. Because, for example, um, when Connie Butler made her exhibition WAG, um, this was a very, very important exhibition who was on different, uh, in different cities uh, um, and institutions. Uh, for example, also in, in Los Angeles, it started in Los Angeles and then it was in MoMA in New York. And she called her, her work show The Feminist Revolution. And then you see also Catherine Morris, uh, she calls her show The Black Radical Woman. And um, also the um, Junta, she calls her also latin america radical woman so radical and revolution i mean revolution is a title more in in a more in a uh, so, a social um, term and um, and i wanted really to create an um, art historian term and so 
I came up with this avant-garde, feminist avant-garde, to um, highlight the pioneering position of, the, of those artists. Yeah, and where can you see the work? You can see the work at the moment in Austria, in Kunstmuseum Lentus, in Linz. After next year, you can see the works in Novi Sad uh, in May, June. And uh, after it will be presented a huge exhibition of the feminist avant-garde on the occasion of the photographic festival in Arles. Yeah, um, that's it. Now I, I go out of the, of the, uh, Thank you, Gabriele. I'm taking the word back from you. Um, this was really fascinating. And I think already I have questions for your, you, even though I'm familiar with what you've been working on. So Naomi is the uh, acting curator of the New Hall Art Collection at Murray Edwards College, Cambridge. It's the largest collection of art by women in Europe. And having graduated from the University of Oxford and the Cortal Institute of Art, she has worked at a number of galleries, including Tate Modern, Kettle's Yard and Pippi Holdsworth here in London. And she has contributed as an author to a number of different publications. So I'll pass it over to you. So I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thank you, Flavia. Can you see me? Just check that. There we go. Hello. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, Flavia, and for having me here. I'm so pleased to either introduce or reacquaint people with the Newhall Art Collection. So first of all, I'll tell you a bit about the history of the collection and then about our program. Um, and I'll try to share my screen, see if this works. Great, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Sorry. Okay, great. So the New Hall Art Collection is a collection of modern contemporary art by women. As Flavia said, it's the largest collection of its kind in Europe and the second largest in the world. It's held at Murray Edwards College, which is one of the two colleges for women at the University of Cambridge. The college was founded as New Hall in 1954 at a time when there were only there was only one female student at Cambridge for every seven male students. And when the college first opened, there were only 16 students. And it was originally in a building on Silver Street in the centre of Cambridge. But a few years later, it migrated to this building on, the la on land given by the Darwin family. And allegedly, Charles Darwin himself planted some of the trees in the garden. So I'll just move to the next slide. The architects of this building were Chamberlain, Powell and Bond, who later designed the Barbican Centre in London. And they worked in collaboration with the president of the college, the first president, Rosemary Murray, to create an iconic brutalist building, which is a manifesto for women's education. And here's some more pictures. There's a feeling of luminosity and ascendance in the building, which is created by the fountain court at the centre of the college, the dome-like dining room and the large windows that flood the college with light. There apparently wasn't enough money for the college to build both a library and a chapel, so instead they decided to construct a library with the appearance of a chapel. The Rosemary Murray Library. So the central nave and columns draw on ecclesiastical architecture and were intended to create a sense that women could ascend physically and academically through knowledge and learning. So at this time in the early 1960s, the college owned a few watercolours and some quite traditional pieces 
on loan from the Arts Council collection. However, in 1968, after, um, the feminist artist Mary Kelly, very pioneering um, American feminist artist, completed a residency at Newhall in collaboration with Kessel's Yard. And the president and fellows of the college acquired her work, Extaz, which I'll show you here. So Extaz is named, is part of a larger body of work called Corpus, each part of which is named after one of the five histor hysterical postures of women as identified by the 19th century psychiatrist Jean-Martin Charcot. And the handwritten texts explore women's experience during the women's liberation movement and mimic the style of women's magazines. And the acquisition provided the stimulus for the creation of this all women's art collection as the fellows of the college began to think about the very stark difference in representation between male and female artists in museums and galleries. And so in 1992, the president at the time, Valerie Pearl and Anne Jones, who's a curator at the Arts Council collection, they assembled a list of 100 artists who they deemed to be the most influential and important women artists practicing in the UK at the time. And they asked whether they would be willing to donate a work and thought that maybe a few of them would say yes. And as it turned out, um, they received 75 donations, which was an extraordinary act of collective giving and indicated the desire to be represented at a time when women artists were largely overlooked by museums and galleries. So today the, coll the collection comprises over 550 works of art, nearly all of which are on permanent display across the college. We're not in the position to be able to buy work, so all of the works that, are, that we have are donated either by artists, alumni, donors, um, and we've recently set up a scheme called the Collecting Collectives, where we pool money and um, acquire works that way. But within Murray Edwards, the collection is a celebration of female agency and creativity. More broadly, it's an art historical record and a living and evolving body of art, which demonstrates the breadth and diversity of women's creativity. The collection tells the story of significant art movements since the 1950s, as reflected in work by women artists, as well as the own, as the re remarkable um, narrative of its own establishment and evolution. And at the heart of the founding mission of the collection are the principles of collaboration and collectivity in which women play the roles of artists, collectors, curators, and patrons. And I feel like it's in stark contrast to the history, founding histories of a lot of other museums which have one sole male figure at their heart. So, for example, with Kettle's Yard, there's this sort of mythical figure of Jim Ede who established it um, somewhere like the British Museum has Hans Sloan, whereas in our, in the case of the New Hall Art Collection, it was very decentralised. It was all of these people working together um, and establishing, establishing something extraordinary. Um, fundamental to the development of the collection is the feminist art historian Professor Griselda Pollock. Her theories about feminist modes of creation inform the history, nature and display of the collection. So for example, the collection includes works by women, artists who have big names and whose works command high prices on the market, such as Tracy Emin, Judy Chicago and Barbara Hepworth, but it also includes works by women who are not necessarily even professional artists. And we try to create a democracy of display when curating the spaces in order not to reflect hierarchies of fame and commercial success, but by judging works on their aesthetic and conceptual merits. Our curator post does not have secure funding, unfortunately, so we have to fundraise for it year on year. And the post is currently being funded by Griselda Pollock, um, who was awarded the Holberg Prize for her outstanding scholarly work over the course of her career and has allocated much of her prize money to fund curators and researchers working on women artists, which I think is the most incredible example of feminism in practice. And we're extremely grateful to her. In terms of our programme, we have two temporary exhibitions 
each year, which are accompanied by programmes of events such as tours, talks, workshops and screenings. And as of a few years ago, we have started to commission performances by artists who respond to artworks in the collection and the very striking architecture of Murray Edwards College, as well as often collaborating with our gardeners. So two recent performances that we hosted were Transpositions by Sophie Sieta, which was part of our exhibition Reproductivities, and Bower of Bliss and Improper Architecture by Linda Sterling, Sterling which we co-commissioned with Cattle's Yard as part of their exhibition, Linderism. And in both cases, they performed in the dome venue, which is um, the kind of main display space for some of our larger artworks. And um, they referenced the, the history of the architecture and responded to artworks that is on display in there. Other performances that we have coming up are by artists Wanja Kimani, Linda Karshan and Emily Perry. Emily Perry makes work surrounding food and womanhood and she'll be responding to a series of artworks in the collection called Cocaine by Gail Chong Quan, who is an artist of mixed Scottish and Chinese Mauritian heritage. So here's one of the works. The, um, the, so the title Cocaine is a reference to a 14th century German poem about a land of sensual pleasures and the five photographs in the series capture seemingly luscious and abundant landscapes which on closer inspection turn out to be made from piles of rotting food. So the one um, on the screen now is constructed out of bread. And Gail has explained that the work is about the contemporary tourist industry and its consumption of the environment because of her Mauritian heritage. Of course, this is something that's close to, um, close to home for her. And Emily's performance, which will be titled Narcissus Naturmort Mukbang, examines women's relationship with food in contemporary society, the, the um, phenomenon of mukbang, where um, people watch each other eat across a screen. Um, as well as art historical depictions of feasting and consumption. And for this performance, our, our head gardener, Joe Cobb, will be growing seasonal vegetables such as spinach and garlic, which will be used in the piece. And we are hoping to engage primary school children, women at Cambridge Women's Aid, as well as members of the public. The young British Kenyan artist, Mwanja Kimani, has created a performance which responds to our current exhibition, Maud Salter, the centre of the frame. Just go to the next slide. Maud Salter was a Scottish Ghanaian artist, poet and curator. Um, she very sadly passed away at the age of only 47 in 2008. She was one of the first artists to donate to the collection when it was first established and she was a vocal champion of it in its early history. And her work, Failure Portrait of Alice Walker, is part of a series of nine photographic portraits of black female artists and writers and performers who are dressed as the nine Greek muses. So our exhibition brings together six of the nine works in the series. And in um, an essay uh, that was published recently, she, Salter was quoted as saying, it's important for me as an individual and obviously as a black woman artist to put black women back in the center of the frame, both literally within the photographic image but also within the cultural institutions where our work operates. And Maud Salter created the series Zabat in 1989 to con commemorate the 150th anniversary of the invention of photography. She called the series a diaspora and family portrait and it challenges the invisibility of black women in art history. Um, so the photographs subvert usual representations of the muses in Western art and highlight the connections between European and African histories and cultures and geographies. And the sitter's front-facing poses and elaborate props recall Victorian studio photography, while the ornate gilt frames, which she referred to in that quote, the literal frames, refer to classical painting. Um, and rather than their usual attributes, the muses hold objects which interweave cross-cultural history. So for example, in her guise as the muse of comedy and poetry, Alice Walker carries a bouquet of flowers, which simultaneously alludes to the black servant law in Edouard Manet's Olympia, um, painted in 1863, 
also to 1960s flower power and to Alice Walker's collection of writings in search of our mother's gardens. And the colours in the bouquet are the same as those in the Ghanaian flag, which is a reference to Salter's heritage. Um, part of the pleasure of curating this exhibition was trying to track down the works in the series. There are three editions of the series altogether. One full set is in the Viennais collection, while the other two sets are scattered around different public and private collections. So two of the works that we have in our exhibition are known from the Arts Council, one from Touchstones Rochdale, which originally commissioned the series and which the exhibition will tour to after it's showing here, one from the collection of the artist Lubaina Hamid, who was Salter's partner for many years and whose work we also have in the collection. And the sixth work that we have, I discovered completely by chance. I was researching another artist in our collection, Claudia Clare, who makes political ceramics works. And I was scrolling through her Instagram profile and stumbled across her, um, a picture of her sitting room where she had one of these works hanging on the wall. And I immediately contacted her and asked her how she came to have it. And she told me that Maud Salter had exhibited some of her works in a gallery that she ran in the 90s. And the gallery was facing some financial difficulties. So instead of paying Claudia in money, Maud paid her with this artwork, which she's had ever since in her sitting room. And these are the types of stories and connections among artists in the collection that I find so interesting to discover. It really does feel like a network um, of women. Um, and the sitter in the portrait owned by Claudia is Dion Sparks, who is also an artist um, who collaborated with Maud Salter on making the series, but hasn't actually seen the portrait in real life since she posed for it 30 years ago. And she will be coming to the collection tomorrow to speak on a panel that we are organising in partnership with the Paul Mellon Centre for British Art, um, which will be live streamed. So if anyone's free tomorrow, um, I would recommend tuning in. Um, and then I'll just quickly tell you about this, the self-portrait in the series, which I think is um, so interesting. Um, so, so one of the works in the series is a self-portrait of Maud Salter dressed as Calliope, the muse of epic poetry. And she reposes and slightly subverts a photograph of the Haitian-born French dancer and actor Jean Duval, who is known almost exclusively for her romantic relationship with Charles Baudelaire. And the photograph of Jean Duval was taken by the renowned 19th century photographer Nadar, who knew Baudelaire and Duval, but who titled his photograph Portrait of an Unknown Woman. And Salter was exasperated by the way in which Duval had been exoticized and anonymized in this way. So she brings her voice back to life in a poem which accompanies this portrait. And in the photograph that Salter creates, she has her hair in a pre-Raphaelite hairstyle. She turns away from a, a, the viewer in this very regal pose. And on the table next to her is a daguerreotype, um, which is a reference to early photography. And then I'll just quickly tell you about the next exhibition in our programme. Um, we, the next show that we're doing starting in February is on textiles art. It will bring together works by a multi-generational international group of artists who use the medium of textiles in a political or activist way. Um, for centuries, art practices associated with textile making were dismissed as women's work, in quotation marks, and excluded from the realm of so-called fine art. Um, but in the 20th and 21st centuries, many women artists have employed and experimented with craft practices, making very powerful statements about gender, race, class and their place in the world. So our exhibition will bring together textile works from our permanent collection by artists such as Miriam Shapiro and Paminda Cowell, alongside key 20th century artists such as the quilt makers of G's Bend and the French pop artist Nicola L, as well as new works by contemporary artists working in the medium of textiles such as Anya Paintsel and Enam Kbeiwonyu. So we're very excited about that next thing on our exhibition list. And then finally, here's another photo of the exterior of Murray Edwards College with its very unique architecture. Um, so I think that's all from me for now.
Thank you, Naomi. Um, so great to be reminded of the wonderful Murray Edwards. And for those who haven't been, I highly recommend it. And also just on a side note, what a serendipitous um, encounter it was for you to find that Maud Salter on Instagram. Um, but I know we're a bit tight on timing, so I'm going to quickly uh, pass it over to Christiana, who I think is all set up now. So let's let's give it a try. Fingers crossed. Eccomi. Tecnici. I hope you can see the present. at the moment. Excellent. Here we are. This is Centro Pecci in Prato, Tuscany, one of the oldest uh, uh, museums of contemporary art in Italy, in the suburb of Prato, industrial city, not far from uh, Florence. Uh, this is the area in which we are, quite far actually from the historic center of uh, Prato, this building at the beginning in the 80s uh, was designed by Italo Calmerini, a rationalist architect uh, that designed this uh, building, this museum, thinking uh, making a clear reference to manufacturing uh, site, a plant uh, within a landscape uh, characterized by industrial architecture in 2016. This building was enlarged with this new part, this golden part, golden facade, Maurizia, uh, an Asian uh, born architect and uh, which doubled uh, the exhibiting uh, areas uh, with new services. Uh, the museum was uh, open to visual arts but open to any sort of art uh, with a uh, theater, one uh, open air, 1000 seats uh, with uh, music festival, important uh, uh, festival uh, and the attention for uh, music was very very important, uh, so we always paid attention to music and other forms of creativity next to visual arts and so design, fashion, even if uh, visual arts are of course uh, prevailing. Uh, this is the first uh, exhibition in 1988, it was named Europe Now one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, and uh, so before of course the creation of the European Union focusing on the European identity opening the European identity to multiple to more uh, uh, diversified uh, uh, culture. This is Anish Kapoor collection. A lot of important exhibitions were uh, held in uh, the, this is uh, uh, Spazio Curvo Dritto, straight curved space. This huge uh, uh, spiral uh, with created with newspapers and uh, neon, neon lights, a spiral that uh, was uh, opened up, that began at the outside the museum and then moved uh, inside the museum. Again, in the 90s, uh, uh, Robert Mappletop, uh, curated by Germano Celep, a retrospective of Gerhard Richter, Gerard Richter uh, the, when he exposed his uh, atlas. Uh, as you can see, a long pathway, a long evolution, which with different ups and downs if you want but uh, when uh, we open up uh, the new area a huge collective exhibition called the end of the world uh, this is a part uh, 
This is a Tsai Kokyang uh, installation. Once again, a huge installation on the other side of the museum, the of Oliveira. A structure you can walk through from a tree, it turns into a building and into a house. And uh, after the opening, very interesting exhibition. This is Jerome Bell personal, and this is Mark Wall uh, exhibition one month before inaugurating one month month before I enter into my capacity of director. It was uh, the year of the 30th anniversary, so when we had to celebrate it, uh, together with the museum staff, we decided to talk, to illustrate the history of the museum uh, through three different languages. Uh, first of all, the archive, so a very, very long uh, timeline. As you can see, describing all activities with physical elements, focusing on the most important uh, uh, moments uh, of the museum uh, life, uh, published publications, a lot of videos and uh, pictures, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, artworks. In that case, it was a super studio, so an architecture, radical architecture installation, and we have a very important collection in the museum. And then in other rooms, uh, we, ex we exposed, exhibited the other uh, artworks uh, acquired. And then the third uh, language we wanted to use uh, is data. Uh, and so we provided to the University of Florence uh, and to the Department of Statistics uh, a lot of data that have been processed and then displayed by Sara de Bond, graphic designer based in Brussels, that uh, created these uh, visual elements reminding and making a clear reference and showing some figures and data about the 30 years of life of the museum. The most impressing figure is the rate and the ratio men women inside all through all the way through the museum history and as uh, in uh, Vienna, actually in Vienna is uh, clearly women oriented, three out of four. Uh, here in uh, Centro Pecci we realized that uh, it was uh, even uh, more important uh, and uh, it was only men oriented actually because out of 91 exhibitions over 30 years, uh, 40, uh, 49 roadshow and zero, no one dedicated to women. That was shocking for all of us, actually. We were really shocked. And also the collection, which is very large, and here again, differently from Vienna, we preferred to map in a broad way an artistic scene. So different artists, uh, 1500, 1500 and 1200 by men and 332 by women and 23 by groups. And so starting from this point, which was quite impressive, as I said, another important point um, was the geographic origin of uh, artists on the show, proving uh, that museums uh, were uh, involving artists mainly in Europe, based in Europe and in the US, uh, exception from uh, uh, Soviet Union and then Russia, where the mu a lot of uh, artists uh, coming from uh, the former Soviet Union 
while other regions uh, in the world, despite being very rich in terms of cultural proposals, were, uh, so to speak, quite neglected, if you want. So, in uh, uh, establishing uh, the program, in setting up the program, we decide to change the situation, open up the museum to new uh, voices, uh, new perspectives. First of all, the voice of uh, women, but to open up uh, to different uh, cultural identities uh, and gender, new gender. One of the very first uh, uh, exhibition was a She Devil Remix. Uh, it is 10 years uh, that it is in Italy with the video works uh, with uh, a very broad network uh, of uh, uh, women curators. Uh, and to celebrate the 10th anniversary of this exhibition, we created a sort of best of, a sort of remix, uh, and we involved uh, 30 women uh, working with the uh, video. This is Lan Tambo and Rachel McLean, uh, but actually we had uh, 30 women represented there. And another exhibition was uh, Soggetto Nomade, to, uh, fo focusing on five photographers uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. A very important moment for Italy in the politics uh, that was an essential uh, presence uh, uh, for women uh, to get civil rights uh, in Italy in that period. Uh, we got the referendum uh, on divorce, uh, for instance, uh, and uh, we changed the, the welfare state also changed. Uh, uh, there was uh, also referendum uh, on uh, abortion uh, and so uh, very important period, historical period for uh, women, and so we wanted to talk about that period uh, with five uh, through the work of five different photographers uh, with uh, an evolving uh, feminine identity. This is why the choice uh, was to pay homage uh, to uh, her collection, uh, Rosa Pridotti to talk about uh, this uh, evolving identity. Lisetta Carmi, Mariana Russo, Paola Agosti, Elisabetta Catalano and Elisabetta Battaglia. So very different shots, very different artworks, uh, but uh, uh, different uh, set and range uh, of uh, approaches uh, focusing on the uh, women universe uh, and the and the a long historic period uh, we have also acquired uh, alexandra me triumph uh, composed of uh, thousands of cups awards uh, won in amateur uh, uh, competitions uh, in sicily and uh, this is the result of a long travel in Sicily where she went uh, meeting uh, uh, people selling uh, these trophies uh, and then these objects uh, are exposed there in a huge landscape. Uh, actually that was interesting. Uh, I say that was interesting for us because this, is, this was really team working. Uh, uh, sharing this work with the people working with me, mainly women, but we thought it was important to represent and start uh, representing within the collection works uh, that uh, were able to provide a specific identity, a powerful uh, image, the collection of the museum, was uh, to have a lot of uh, environment so works that are uh, having a dialogue, a connection with the surrounding uh, place where they are. And so we wanted to include uh, uh, artworks uh, 
carried out by this artist, Alexandra Mir. Marialba Russo, one of the women of the Soggetto Nomade, was represented by this shot taken in Naples in the 70s and the 80s, just dedicated to mapping, serial mapping, all, all erotic uh, uh, movies, uh, uh, posters uh, that uh, were exposed in uh, public uh, areas. I saw Marialba Russo take shots uh, of them, uh, realizing that it was quite peculiar uh, phenomenon for Italy in that period of time, uh, which uh, was uh, which lasted very very uh, shortly. And so, as you can see, the body of uh, women that is now an object, um, and, but in a Catholic country, uh, you can see women as an active uh, subject from the sexual standpoint. Uh, and as Naomi said, uh, talking about the next uh, exhibition on textile arts, just to transmit uh, social and political messages and uh, protest. Uh, this is the title of an exhibition of ours. Five artists on the use of uh, fabrics, not necessarily related to craftsmanship, but uh, textile and fabric uh, as a way to convey social and uh, political uh, message. In that case is an artist from Mexico. Every single artist had one room dedicated to her, so a broad possibility of uh, expression. And so the goal uh, was to enter into details. Marinella Senatore Ottobon Kanga one part of the room this is a Turkish artist working in a community of women victims of violence the local community and uh, we did, I did not want to focus uh, on the exhibition, uh, this is another of the exhibition we have recently organized, dedicated to Simon Forti, that was born uh, in uh, Prato from a textile uh, family, and that was forced to move away to go to Switzerland and then to California, and this exhibition was focusing on a specific aspect of Simon Forti work, opening up to other research domains, so news animation. So Simon reacted the way the body can react to some news. And uh, we have the videos of these uh, this is what she did in the 80s uh, and uh, until recent times with the prep uh, drawings, preparatory drawings uh, and other works uh, of performance. So every week a reenactment uh, of some of her performances. Uh, and this exhibition was uh, uh, wrapped around the sound specifically conceived and created for this performance and uh, Simon wrote a bit of uh, her uh, uh, journal uh, and uh, related based uh, on her childhood in Italy so that sound was a shell wrapping around the space uh, in which other aspects of her work were represented and then we also open up uh, an important uh, personal exhibition of uh, Chiara Fumai. She worked, she's from Italy, she worked a lot with performance but also with other art languages and she focused on radical women, radical uh, feminist uh, theories. 
with the strong uh, topics uh, whose uh, work also in Italy was not uh, that uh, popular. We have uh, done that in collaboration with uh, contemporary sub in Geneva, Casa Encendida in Madrid, and the Lodge in Brussels. And these are some shots of the exhibition. Here you can see the reconstruction of the house where she lived, and she wanted to bring the house as a work of art. She passed away in 2019, quite young, but we thought it was important to uh, accomplish her desire. These are some of the shots of the exhibition, very much appreciated that allowed everybody to discover the work of this artist in Italy, but not only in Italy. As you can see, this is uh, the work we have, the poems, uh, uh, with a lot of curator and uh, complete uh, body of work. And uh, this is something we have worked on with books, uh, a series of books. Uh, Nero is the publishing company and books more than catalogues. So uh, separate uh, book uh, supporting, going together, complementing, well, uh, uh, complementing, but it's a way to enter into specific details. Uh, this was done uh, not only on uh, focusing on women identity and other important uh, aspects of artistic practices, art practices in Italy and uh, all over the world, but also working on a deep change of institution, institutions that uh, was uh, also seen as a, a, a main perspective. I'm the first. Uh, women director after Ida Panicelli only one year and a half at the beginning of the 90s and then only men before me and the internal curator, the one uh, authorized to sign project was a man but in the exhibition office uh, there were three very skilled person with an important uh, background And so the idea was to create a sort of empowerment within the institution. So providing these people a position just to propose a project and sign them. And so all, uh, this, uh, exhibi all these exhibitions uh, were carried out uh, with the support of the museum curators uh, and also these books uh, were uh, written and published uh, with the support of a young woman uh, that uh, followed the old work. Well, I'm not here to just to show the importance of women, but uh, I think that uh, in our institution it was important uh, to break up and to have a reversal of tendency from the past uh, until not long ago, only men. And so within the institution, the possibility of giving voice to new ideas uh, about art, uh, about this sort of expression was important uh, as to give room uh, to the work of uh, artists uh, and this work uh, of empowerment uh, passed uh, through an activity of uh, very strong uh, public program activity. Just to conclude, I would like to say that uh, for me, it was important not only to represent a women identity, but also to open up uh, to all different identities. So an important part of our program is given to the queer culture, 
and to dialogue and the definition of identity because I think that uh, this is very important, um, especially inside the uh, context as uh, we are uh, in Centro Pecci, where this uh, culture is uh, strongly based on uh, before and uh, on man. There is no happy ending, unfortunately, because now we were about to open up a, a, a personal exhibition of Tao Fei uh, in collaboration with the Maxi and uh, Prato in uh, Europe is the third city with the largest Chinese uh, community after Paris and uh, London. And, so the, the Chinese community in Prato is one-fifth of the total uh, population, uh, but uh, actually we did not uh, want uh, to represent uh, beforehand uh, such an important uh, part of the community. Uh, so the exhibition of Cao Fei and a large uh, personal exhibition uh, to a Chinese photographer and other projects to involve, to get closer to the Chinese community. And Cao Fei exhibition was something like the finishing point to some extent, but the beginning of October, I'm not there anymore. And the goal, the legitimate intention of uh, providing a change of speed, so opening it up to large exhibitions, more uh, so meant to attract mass audience, but this change, legitimate change, was uh, done uh, overnight, so to speak. Uh, as it is sometimes the case in institutions, uh, I think this is not uh, healthy for institution, but this is the case. And uh, the program that was uh, thought, uh, organized and set up for this year has been cancelled. The new exhibition has been uh, presented, an exhibition that will be inaugurated uh, tomorrow with works of collection and we said the collection of the museum was only by men in this over the past few years we decided to bridge this gender gap also through uh, tenders and we have participated and we won some tenders and we have no money to purchase artworks, but we were able to purchase important uh, artworks uh, of women, but the exhibition that is that will be inaugurated tomorrow, and uh, as you can see, we have uh, this, uh, so only five women and uh, 45 men, and so this is, I think, uh, a clear, a strong uh, statement considering uh, what we have done and I think uh, that uh, in the new guidelines for the future of the museum uh, there will be not a lot of room for women. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Cristiana, and um, it was really great to see the trajectory in terms of like the work you've done um, introducing the, a greater representation of women in an institution that traditionally, as you pointed out, has been very male centric. And it's honestly, we, we discussed this amongst ourselves quite shameful and disappointing that the institution has um, pulled out of this program, pulled out of the support um, in terms of your vision. And I think is that if there's maybe like a feel rouge um, 
or an interesting point for us to take away is also what Gabriele was explaining, what Naomi was explaining. They are collections that have grown over the years and uh, they have benefited from having time and growth. Um, I'm really sorry, uh, but unfortunately, Camille had to leave uh, because she had to... Um, uh, catch a train and in fact we're already running over by five minutes but I wonder you know if there is a question a reflection I want to give an opportunity mainly to the speakers um, if there's some thoughts you would like to share I think we can spare a couple of minutes I don't know exactly how you share your thoughts but I think that I see a hand so I think one presses a hand on the bar on the left. Or, or you can also raise a hand like this. Um, well, if there are no, no considerations, no thoughts, then maybe we can um, leave it to this. And I can only thank um, Gabriele, Naomi, Christiana for the presentations, which, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of these institutions, but I always feel I'm discovering something new and something new about visions that really are bringing women to the fore. And uh, that is a mission that I think we all support um, in our own practices and curatorial work. So thank you so much. And I'm sorry we don't have more time for questions. And I also apologize for all the technical issues. Um, those were out of my control. But thank you, thank you all um, for uh, speaking and joining me today.